Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to this month's Boiler Engineers Fireside Chat. I'm uh, Chuck Davidson, 1972 alumni of the School of Chemical Engineering and serving as host of this month's virtual event. Hopefully you've attended some of the prior Fireside Chats. The purpose of these chats is to highlight the work taking place within the College of Engineering and the importance that work is in moving us towards research-driven and results-oriented programming that are drivers of our universities and, and college's reputation. Prior events had covered such topics as the innovation ecosystem at Purdue, our pharmaceutical research, and engineering's role in the Purdue's innovation campus. Today, we're going to discuss the College of Engineering's giant leaps to move engineering research into the marketplace. And as in a shining example of that, we'll have as guests later in the program, Professor Linda Wang from the School of Chemical Engineering and Dan Hassler, president of Hassler Ventures, who will be speaking on their work. Uh, first, just a housekeeping item. You can see it up in the chat box. We just wanna make sure this is as interactive as possible to allow you to ask questions. Just use the chat fe feature to post your questions. We have set aside uh, throughout this event for Q&A. Um, next, I'll be turning the program over to Dean Meng Chang. Uh, to this audience, Dean Chang needs no introduction. He is Purdue's Executive Vice President for Strategic Initiatives, reporting directly to President Daniels and the John A. Edwardson Dean of the College of Engineering. Since uh, joining us as Dean in 2017, Mung's leadership over the College of Engineering has been truly driving us towards the pinnacle of excellence at scale. Some of you may have just seen where Purdue's engineering graduate program was recently ranked number four in the country, moving up three positions in just one year. So with that, let me turn it over to Dean Chang for his opening comments. Thank you so much, Chuck. Great to see you, and uh, it's an honor to have you as the host of uh, this month's uh, virtual fireside with uh, Boilermaker engineers, uh, friends, families, alumni. Uh, and we are indeed uh, very excited to have a conversation about this topic on uh, from research to marketplace. So uh, I uh, thank you for doing a bit of my typical advertisement with Boiler Pride uh, on the pinnacle of excellence at scale. And I think that as a land grant university, uh, in addition to learning and research, we do also have a special responsibility and opportunity to take some of our fundamental research breakthroughs into the marketplace and benefit the industry, society at large. Uh, so I'm eager to have a uh, dialogue with you first, the Chuck, and answer maybe some of your questions, and then answer some of the questions from our audience before we turn the mic over to the featured speakers today. Well, great, and, and thank you so much for this opportunity, and, and what, a, what an opportunity it is to hear, hear your thoughts about the progress that is happening there at Purdue and the College of Engineering, and maybe, maybe just to start, uh, you know, maybe you can just provide a, a little bit more on your thoughts on the importance of uh, companies and industry partners play within the college's research uh, efforts. 
Yeah, certainly. Uh, I think that uh, there are two sides to this issue. You know, one is, uh, indeed, there are certain uh, research breakthroughs that deserves to be given a chance to translate into either IP or products or maybe a whole new enterprise, a company or nonprofit. But then there's a, the other side of the coin that perhaps is just as important, and that is often the translation process sharpens the fundamental research and benefits the teaching of the material to students. And one example uh, in one of my own startups at a previous institution I did uh, was on the wireless communications along with the team we had together. We had the first set of investor money. We had the first uh, uh, set of customers. Uh, and now it's uh, blossomed into uh, serving about 60 million users around the world, mostly in developing countries, to help bridge the digital divide in uh, 4G and 5G wireless networks. And it's tremendously satisfying to see how the equations got used by people. Uh, and it's also very beneficial for me and my team uh, as researchers and as teachers. You know, the translation process forced us back to the blackboard many times to revisit some of the assumptions we had to make in our work, fundamental research and publications and sharpen the model, the results, the algorithms, the protocols. It also made us better teachers. So as we teach undergrad and graduate students in wireless communications, I will be able to borrow from the experiences I had in leading this company and uh, understanding the marketplace and how that might impact the way that we can understand and appreciate the textbook material for the students' future careers. And I believe a similar kind of uh, synergy between research teaching on the one hand and the process of taking it to the market also exists in many of the other companies that we are seeing here at Purdue. You know, um, I, along with our audience, uh, I'm very excited to hear the message uh, from uh, Professor Wang uh, later in this program, as well as from Dan Hassler. Um, but, you know, regarding her work on such as turning plastics into fuels and and of course the important topic of, of uh, rare earth metals uh, separation. Um, maybe just stepping aside from that for a minute, could you talk about some of the other research areas within the college that you see as presenting opportunities that might yield you know, similar results and similar collaborations and, and uh, avenues for uh, uh, creating uh, other partnerships? Well, indeed, uh, Chuck, you know, there are many outstanding faculty here at Purdue Engineering, and not all of them uh, need to participate in this translation process. Not all of them are interested, which is absolutely fine. I think excellence in research comes in many different shapes and colors, and we appreciate different formats of excellence. However, there is an increasing number of them who are interested in trying this out either by licensing the technology uh, and work with bigger companies or by creating their own enterprise, forming a team to execute the ideas directly to the end users, whether they are enterprise users or consumer users. So examples uh, range from energetic material and hypersonics on the national security front uh, to uh, AI and machine learning uh, products uh, to uh, digital agriculture products, uh, to uh, different types of uh, imaging uh, solutions. And today we'll soon be hearing from one of the, uh, I'll say, crown jewels uh, of these uh, translational efforts from uh, Professor Wang and from uh, Dan Hassler. Uh, but I think across the board, uh, throughout all the departments and schools in Purdue Engineering, we can find the faculty members uh, from uh, system professors to chair professors uh, who are engaged in these translation. Just another another topic I, th I, th I think we maybe our audience would be interested in, and I mentioned it at the opening about the, 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 the recent uh, ranking of the graduate program at Purdue. And of course, there have been a number of other recognitions of the, the College of Engineering. And uh, 
it really strikes me in a, in a national ranking that you could move three positions in, in one year. That is astounding. And I think, as you've made the point before, to be at the number four position at the scale that Purdue's engineering is, is quite unique. I, I think, you know, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on how this is happening. And, you know, what are the drivers behind it? And where do you see it, see it going? Uh, well, Chuck, I think the ranking really follows reputation. And what we're seeing in any magazine's annual enumeration is a reflection of the outstanding work by all the faculty members, their students, and our staff. And it's a reflection of their individual accomplishments and the institution gets to enjoy that reflection. Uh, the uh, graduate and research ranking in particular uh, puts uh, a bit of emphasis on the research productivity and competitive extramural research awards, as well as uh, publication, citation, uh, and the general uh, concept of reputation by peers and corporate partners. Uh, and we have uh, been always in a very strong position, uh, especially considering that we are not on the coast, not in the city, not with a medical school. We are the only one in the top 10, top 12 uh, over the past many years uh, that's uh, of that type. But uh, in, the, in particular recent years, our faculty are garnering so many awards and the research productivity uh, continues to climb. And there's been so many national research centers that we competed for and won that uh, uh, it's only, I think, a natural and accurate reflection of that uh, in the latest uh, ranking. And you mentioned there are also some other uh, rankings out there, one of which is quite fitting to today's topic. Uh, is the ranking of uh, the number of startup companies that license a university's IP. And I know that Dan Hassler, as the uh, former president of Purdue Research Foundation uh, and one of the key movers along with uh, President Mitch Daniels over the years, uh, feel a great sense of satisfaction to see that according to that metric, last year, Purdue University as a whole uh, was ranked, I think, uh, number six in the world, uh, and maybe number three in the United States. Uh, and the College of Engineering faculty, I think, are proud to contribute to about 75% of uh, those startup companies. And another ranking that just came out is the uh, Wall Street Journal ranking on the number of patents received from the US patent and trademark office uh, by any university around the world. And uh, in that ranking, uh, Purdue University as a whole was ranked this year number six in the world. And that includes, however, UC and UT as two university systems with multiple research intensive campuses and hospitals. And then that also includes Stanford and Johns Hopkins, both of which have outstanding healthcare systems. Uh, so. Uh, looking at those that are really one uh, main research campus without a medical school, uh, Purdue ranked right below MIT and above everybody else. And the College of Engineering faculty contributed to 64% of those patents. So I think there are many ways we can look at this uh, quantification, no matter how crude and approximate uh, they might be, they do reflect the strength of our talent uh, and the results of their success. You've, you've been experiencing some exciting growth in the uh, College of Engineering here very recently. Um, and I understand that uh, the, 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 uh, the fall enrollment is, is quite large. Um, how are you uh, adjusting to that? I mean, it's an amazing growth and it is, has a lot of implications, but, but, but uh, how are you taking that on and, and what maybe are some of the reasons why mm -hmm. Purdue is being so successful in recruiting these outstanding new students? Well, yes. Well, Chuck, uh, indeed, if uh, we were to host you here in person, you would see it right now at this moment outside my 
office in Armstrong Hall of Engineering a lot of young men and women uh, who are running between classes. Uh, and uh, we have classes started for about two weeks now. Uh, and people are wearing masks indoors and uh, making sure we keep everybody safe. Uh, it is exciting to see the largest ever incoming class uh, to the university and also to the College of Engineering. Uh, the number is over 3,000 first year engineers that we have welcomed warmly to our campus, which makes our undergrad population collectively to be uh, 10,700, and that's not counting the agricultural biological engineering majors. Uh, and we we'll also have 4,000 master PhD students on campus and another 2,500 or so online. So that makes us actually the largest uh, enrollment uh, ever to be ranked in the top five of the country in any discipline in history. While we are very proud to welcome all the students from around the country and around the world, uh, we also do want to make sure that there's adequate resource support and sufficient individualization to make their learning experience of the highest caliber too. Now, I think the frozen tuition and the safe reopening of campus last year both contributed a lot and the ranking and the reputation out there also helps. Uh, it's not easy to find another institution with outstanding engineering program at this tuition and fee rate with this much focus on their learning uh, programs and with a ranking as high as we have here at Purdue Engineering. Frankly, I cannot think of a, a, another institution with uh, a better collection of these metrics. Uh, so we now have the responsibility to make sure that uh, we have sufficient numbers of instructors, professors, advisors, TAs, and lab spaces. Uh, the gateway complex opening next year will be helpful. And Chuck, I have to say that uh, uh, we are also agilely reforming our curricula. We are putting, putting together the experiential learning outside of classrooms through the GRIT program, G-R-I-T, for global research, industry co-op, and team-based projects, learning experience. Uh, because after all, it's not just about how much we cover, but how much we uncover uh, with the students together as a passage of self-exploration and the personal growth. We are immensely proud of all the Boilermaker students, we want to serve them well, uh, we want to give them a rigorous uh, education, and also uh, making sure that uh, they will be able to personally grow. Uh, we have this uh, uh, underestimate of uh, the yield rate, which is in part what led to a surprisingly large number of uh, students. Uh, and we have uh, uh, estimated yield to be historic level. It turns out to be breaking a brand new record, meaning that there are more students and parents voting with their feet uh, coming to Purdue Engineering than we thought there would be. We're gonna have to adjust that by the way, uh, to make sure that uh, the growth will be also well controlled and fully supported. Great, great. I see we've got a question at the chat. Uh, so um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll switch to that. And uh, the question is, does Purdue have current statistics on the success rate, uh, either in terms of mergers, acquisitions, or IPOs of startups, either from licensing of Purdue intellectual property or as spinoffs through Purdue's own incubation platforms for the past and the, the question goes five, 10 years. Through, through these data, any insights on potential missing links or areas to be improved so that Purdue ecosystem outside could be of great help? In other words, a, a broader question about just what's our sense of the success of these, of these, uh, these companies we're partnering with? Well, uh, Chuck, uh, you know this uh, uh, better than uh, uh, many of us uh, as a leader uh, in the energy sector, innovation uh, and investment uh, that uh, sometimes it takes a bit of time and patience to see the return on the investment in certain types of startups. And Dan Hassler in a few minutes uh, will have the mic and tell us more about the history of how he 
and Mitch Daniels thought about ways to improve entrepreneurship here at Purdue starting just about a few years ago, I would say. Uh, so I think the jury and the verdict is still out. We need to perhaps wait a couple more years to see the full statistics on the exit, merger, acquisition, IPO, and so on. Uh, but uh, I do know that, uh, at least anecdotally, that we have a lot of companies that are getting additional investment. Now, it is important to recognize that we cannot walk alone in this endeavor. It is slightly unnatural, in fact, for a university like Purdue to be so successful in entrepreneurship. And we need to take it to the next level by partnering with many out there, including investors, but also those who can help complete the teams. And the number one lesson that I learned as an entrepreneur myself is the who before the what. And often it's the team, it's the people that investors are betting on. Everybody can come up with powerful PowerPoints and beautiful ideas. It is the team that can execute and pivot, listen to the market, and fail fast enough that can eventually deliver the returns. So <clears throat> I think we absolutely need both here in West Lafayette and Indiana in general, as well as in other hubs where our alumni live. So I want to highlight, for example, the John Martinson Center for Engineering Entrepreneurship, thanks to uh, uh, John Martinson, another wonderful boilermaker who gave us a gift to support students. I know that uh, Purdue Research Foundation has certain activities here on campus. Uh, and uh, recently we uh, opened a new incubator in the Silicon Valley. The location, the address is 635 Bryant Street uh, in Palo Alto. So Bryant Street is a little bit just off of from uh, the Main Street in downtown Palo Alto. And this is a co-working space that Purdue uh, put together uh, and a welcome, not only our current student faculty, but also uh, the alumni companies to use the space. And what we really need is that densification of connectedness across talents, capital, and the management teams. So there's a lot more that we can do and must do. Uh, it's well, still miles away, I think, from achieving the full potential of the, the Boilermakers' uh, uh, potential impact to the marketplace. Well, Dean Chang, uh, we really appreciate your, your insights today. Uh, that's, a, that's a great overview of, of not only the College of Engineering and some of the exciting things that are being done, but also particularly on this topic of how we partnership with uh, uh, entrepreneurs outside the university to leverage the intellectual property that we're developing and, and, and help, as you say, hone it and, and get it ready for market. So I think at this stage of the program, maybe I will turn it back to you so that we could um, uh, hear from our guest speakers. Thank you, Chuck. Well, now it's my distinct honor to introduce a fantastic colleague and faculty from the <laughs> Davidson School of Chemical Engineering. Uh, Chuck was too modest to, uh, to uh, mention that the full name of our chemical engineering school is the Davidson School, thanks to an outstanding yeah. gift from Chuck and his family. Uh, and uh, Linda Wang uh, is a chair professor in the Davidson School of Chemical Engineering and incredibly gifted, uh, talented researcher, teacher, and entrepreneur, uh, especially in the space of separation technology. And I had to learn a lot in order to fully understand the Professor Wang's uh, inventions and research articles in separation. And there are many applications, one of which is rare earth metals and elements. Uh, and then there's also conversion of plastics from waste to useful products. And the implications to uh, environmental protection to national security to industries ranging from uh, semiconductors to aerospace is tremendous when it comes to uh, the rare earth. And the other co-guest speaker today, well, we're lucky today to have two guest speakers. Uh, tagging team is uh, Linda's uh, teammate, uh, Mr. Dan Hassler, as alluded to, that uh, 
Dan uh, was the president of Purdue Research Foundation and really the driver of the overall entrepreneurial innovation ecosystem at Purdue. Uh, and recently uh, he stepped down from that position, trying to retire. And Brian Adaman took over. Some of you met Brian, one of the fireside chats before, uh, but uh, I guess retirement doesn't fit Dan's uh, personality. And now Dan uh, is working with Professor Wang in commercializing the exciting technologies for rare earth separation. So I'm gonna turn the mic and the slide view to Dan and Linda, please. Okay, so uh, can I share the screen? Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, we can, Linda, thank you. Okay, great, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, uh, be par the part of this chat. Uh, so uh, somehow I was talking to, talking about two important grand challenges, the plastic waste problem and uh, producing high purity rare earth in the US. And I'm happy to be here to report to you what uh, our contributions are and hopefully we have some uh, promising results in the future in solving these grand challenges. So, so the, the slide, okay. So uh, first I'd like to talk about plastic fuels and I uh, want to tell you about the plastic pollution problem. And I want to raise three key questions. Number one, will the planet be inhabitable by 2050? Number two, can we afford to clean up the oceans and the landfills? Number three, can we save the planet in time? I don't have definitive answers to these questions, but I just want to, to bring to your attention these three important problems. And then I'm going to talk to you about the Purdue technology on hydrothermal processing for converting plastics to fuels and uh, some potential impact and a very short conclusion. So some of you might have seen this giant uh, Texas size, the garbage patches in the Pacific oceans. But unfortunately, this is a small tip of the iceberg of the total plastic waste. So the first deepest dive into the Mariana Trench, 36,000 feet deep, the scientists didn't find any exotic organisms. They found a plastic bag. And actually plastics and plastic waste and microplastics are everywhere uh, from the, the Arctic Ocean floor uh, to all the way to the microplastics in the snow from the Alps. And actually you can find microplastics in land, freshwater and oceans. You can find them in beach sands, sea salts, fish, seabirds. And this plastic pollution kills about 100,000 marine mammals per year. And pretty soon you're gonna find them on the food on your consumer plates. So this is a very concerning problem because uh, we have produced 8 billion metric tons of plastic waste by 2015. And 76% uh, of the waste is landfilled, 12% incinerated, and eight, nine, less than 9% was recycled, reused, and 3% went up in the oceans. And the question is, if we continue business as usual, we'll have more plastic wa uh, waste than fish in the oceans. So this currently, the current technologies like incineration or mechanical recycling have not been effective for reducing the waste accumulation. And the plastic waste degrades slowly over centuries. So that's why you see microplastics everywhere. And from our preliminary estimate, this will take 10,000 times the global GDP to clean up the oceans, which we can definitely not afford. So it's very critical to convert the plastic waste to use for products. Hopefully this will create a driving force to reduce the plastic waste accumulation associated with pollution. So we have been studying this hydrothermal processing of plastic waste to fuels. We think this may be a good idea. So if you put plastic waste at subcritical, supercritical water in the reactor with a temperature 250 to 500 degrees Celsius at a pressure of one to 30 megapascal, and 90% of this plastic waste can become oil and the, the rest 10% will become gas and the uh, solid additives will be recovered separately and the water can be recycled and reused. So for example, uh, this 
one example, the polyethylene waste. This is type two, type four. This is your plastic uh, bags and uh, milk jugs and containers. And the type five plastic waste is polypropylene waste. And these are the, the caps of the, your drinks and the other yogurt containers. And if you uh, put this mixture into this hydro thermal processing reactor, the 90% of these plastic will, will become oil and we can use a simple separation to separate into clean gasoline and clean diesel. If you have a polyethylene waste, the plastic bags, we can convert them into clean wax. So the oils from this hydrothermal processing, uh, after separation to gasoline and the diesel fractions, we have checked the carbon number distribution and the types of chemicals in this uh, mixture. And you can see that our uh, gasoline products are very similar to that of the commercial gasoline and our diesel product in terms of carbon distribution and types of chemicals are also very similar to the commercial diesel. So we also check the, the properties of these uh, products and we find that uh, the gasoline fraction can meet all the requirements for ultra low sulfur gasoline in this left diagram. So if the properties, all these properties fell into the green region, that means they met the requirements. If the, the data points fell into the red regions, that means they are not qualified for the product. So you can see that both the gasoline products and diesel products have met all the requirements for gasoline or diesel fuels. And this is also very energy efficient. Uh, this energy required for a conversion is much lower than producing the fuels from pyrolysis or from crude oil in the conventional way, and much more efficient than recycling uh, these polymers to, uh, again, mechanical recycling. And uh, this is, uh, has a little bit more energy consumption than incineration. However, incineration generates a lot of CO2, so it's not desirable. If you look at the greenhouse gas emissions uh, of this process, our process is also the uh, lowest compared to fuels from pyrolysis or for producing fuels from crude oil in the conventional way. So the point is that this process is energy efficient and environmentally friendly. And this process can also convert, as I said, from polyethylene waste uh, into clean wax or the type one PET waste into monomers. And um, so the, this has other uh, processes that I didn't have time to get into, but potentially this hydrothermal process uh, can convert 60 to 80% of the plastic waste into use for products. And this will recover $100 billion of gasoline and diesel fuels from the polyolefin uh, products and 14 billion uh, monomers uh, for, of, uh, from type one uh, plastic waste. And in this process, we reduce the CO2 emission by one to six tons per ton of plastic waste converted. And we can reach, reduce the crude oil consumption for producing the gasoline and diesel fuels. And we can achieve circular use of materials and we can reduce the risk of plastic pollution to the environment and potentially human health. So can we save the planet in time I don't know the answer, but I think you can help by replace, reduce, and recycle. And we must increase the current recycle rate from less than 10% to greater than 80% to make a, a difference um, in the plastic waste accumulation. I encourage you not to mix plastics with trash because retrieving the plastic from, from landfills is a very costly. And the clean sorted plastic waste gives the highest the, the a profit in the processing. Um, and we must have pub new pu public policies, laws, incentives for reducing plastic waste. And we must have improve our infrastructures for waste collection and processing. So in the future, we hope uh, to uh, change this current linear path from crude oil to refinery into chemicals and chemical plants into plastic products and after use into landfills or incinerators or the oceans will change this linear path into a more circular path. We can collect the waste and process in this uh, process and separate by simple distillation into clean diesel or clean gasoline fuels or in other cases we can produce pure clean wax. 
We can also produce oil, and this will be sent back to the refineries and to, to uh, re made into monomers, and then to reuse those monomers to synthesize uh, the plastic products. So quickly jump switch gear to about the purification of rare earth elements from waste magnets and mineral ores. So uh, I want to uh, tell you that why the rare earth elements are critical materials, they're in shortage, and why China has the monopoly of the high purity rare earth elements at this time, and how the Purdue innovation based on chromatography which is versatile, scalable, uh, and for design optimization scale up, can produce high purity uh, rare earths from waste magnets and mineral concentrates. And I hope you come to the conclusion to be optimistic that this innovation is a solution to our massive future supply crunch. So rare earth elements are the 70 elements on the periodic table. They make materials stronger, lighter, better, and tools smaller, more efficient, and more powerful. I'll just give you a few examples. Your motors on the electric vehicles and the generators on the windmill. And these are made from uh, three um, uh, rare earth elements. And uh, the your energy saving light bulbs are, you know, use several of the uh, rare earth elements and your TV screens requires at least two of the uh, rare earth elements that the European uh, European gives a bright uh, brilliant red and the turbine gives it a bright uh, green color and your catalytic uh, converter requires at least two of the rare earth elements so the rare earth elements are also important for our defense applications, for targeting, for weapons, for communication, for guidance, control, electric motors, uh, jet engines. And as an example, your fighter jet requires more than 900 pounds of rare earth elements. Your destroyers requires more than 5,000 pounds. And your submarine uh, requires more than 9,000 pounds of rare earth elements. So uh, about 30% by weight of the rare earth elements are used for making per, uh, permanent magnets. And uh, these re represents about 80% of the total market value of rare earth. And these are in your hardest drives and uh, your electric uh, motors, um, your N MMR machines and your generators of wind turbines. And uh, it's according to this projection, there's a huge growing demand of the rare earth magnets you know, shown here. You can see that by 2035, a large fraction of the magnets are used in electrical vehicles or, or, or small cars or wind turbines or generators. And the other, the rest of the market is also following a similar trend. The current the rare earth supply chain starts from mineral ores. A lot after a lot of hard work of digging uh, processing, concentrating, and uh, producing these concentrates. And then they're further going through very elaborate separation processes to become high purity rare earth materials. And this represents about $8 billion per year for rare earth, uh, pure rare earth elements. And these, but after they make into finished product, the value is more than $4 trillion per year. So the supply risk uh, is the follows. So the economists already pre projected the dominance of China in terms of minerals or in terms of pure rare earth materials and uh, the manufacturing components of high-tech products. The most worrisome is this red projection. By 2040, China can manufacture over 80, 90% of high-tech products. So many economists consider this a major failure of the U.S. defense and industrial policy. And China's monopoly of the rare earth supplies for the following reasons. China has the largest rare earth reserves. And uh, Deng Xiaoping famously said in 1992, Middle East has oil, but China has rare earth. And since then, they made a very large government investment in the infrastructures and the production of the rare earth elements. And China has the lowest energy cost, lowest labor costs, and motivated workers, and they have low environmental standards. For these reasons, China can produce the 
rare earth at the lowest uh, global production cost, about 50% lower than anywhere else. For this reason, there's, there are no high purity rare earth production uh, in the US at present. So the challenges of producing high purity rare earth from ores are the following. So most of the 17 rare earth elements existing together as a mixture in ores at very low concentrations, a few parts per million. And they have similar uh, properties. They have the same valence, uh, similar size and similar chemical and physical properties. And the, the old, the conventional technology is the use solvent extraction, which requires about a thousand mixer separate units to, just to separate two rare earth elements like this. And the worst problem is the discharge of the hazardous waste in the lake. So in China, in the Inner Mongolia, which was considered one of the 10 most polluted sites in the world. And Purdue innovation is to pre replace solvent extraction by chromatography separation. And the chromatography has orders of magnitude higher interfacial area for mass transfer per unit area. To give you the example, one equilibrium stage in solvent extraction is about one meters in the dimensions, whereas uh, one equilibrium stage in chromatography is only one meter in height, which can have uh, I mean, 1,000 state equilibrium stages. So it's much more efficient system. And chromatography separation over Earth, uh, you know, uh, in the commercial cation exchange sorbents, unfortunately, they don't have selectivity. So the chelation sorbents, which have selectivity, but have, are very expensive and with limited stability. So we have developed the, the method based on low cost absorbance and selective ligands in the labor, uh, mobile phase and which have broad selectivities for rare earth elements. So to give you a very brief introduction, what is the chromatography? So uh, you can imagine uh, the, uh, the, the metal ions are students are dressed in uh, pink, say undergraduate students, okay? And, uh, and you have tango dancers, which have very peculiar uh, preference for dancing with different guests with different colors. For example, the EDTA has a great preference for uh, people dressed in, in blue, let's say alums, Purdue alums, okay? And second preference is the graduate students who are dressed in gold. Third preference is the students, undergraduate students dressed in pink. And the least preference, uh, least preferred partner is the under, uh, is the high school students, let's say, dressed in green. And now if you want to separate the graduate students, undergraduate students, high school students, and we can design a <coughs> separation system, okay? Just imagine if the Davidson School of Chemical Engineering building is 100 floors in height, and we can have an alumni party, reception party full of foods. And then we can, uh, let's say the building is fully occupied by the visiting alums, they are dressed in blue. Okay, then we bring in the group of students which are dressed, the graduate student, undergraduate student, and the, and the high school students, they're dressed in different colors. And uh, these students were quickly displaced alum uh, to occupy the top floor, okay, near the entry uh, point. And then we can bring in uh, these tango dancers into the building and imagine these tango dancers were most prefer to dance with the gold students and the pink students and the green students in that preference order. And if this process continues, you will see that pretty soon because the gold students spend more time dancing with the, the dancers and they are escalators only going downward uh, in one direction into the bottom of the floor. And uh, this peculiar uh, elevator system will bring the gold uh, students ahead of the pink students and the, ahead of the green students. And as, the, as soon as the tango dancer sees the blue, uh, dre the alarm dressed in blue, uh, he, she would immediately drop off the gold students and start dancing with the, the blue student, uh, the, the blue uh, alums. Okay, so you can imagine this process proceeds and pretty soon you'll see that the 
the Davidson School of Chemical Engineering building was be separated into four zones, the alum zone and the, the graduate student zone, undergraduate student zone and high school student zone. At this process, your patient waiting at the exit of the bottom of the chemical engineering, you can see the, the exit of the uh, exit of the, the groups in terms of graduate students, in terms of undergraduate students and high school students. So I hope this, uh, this example helps you to understand what is a chromatography. So the second uh, uh, technology is we have very versatile, efficient and scale, scalable design method and simulation tools. So once we have the feed and system specs and we can measure intrinsic parameters, which are independent of the size of the scale of this operation or the feed composition, and we can use the design simulation tools to design the operating conditions in the system. And we can use this uh, checking between this experimental results with the uh, simulation uh, uh, predictions and uh, and uh, if they're in agreement, then we can scale up for pilot testing and further for com commercial testing. So we think this technology is is has potential to change the current linear path of the magnet materials. Um, so right now, as you know, the mineral uh, ores are you know gone through very uh, extensive concentrating and separation processes to produce high purity three elements and then they are made into magnets and other rare earth products at the end of the life 99 percent of this went to landfills and this is a terrible wasteful because you lost three billion dollars worth of rare earth materials to landfills and the associated embodied energy of 10 million barrels of crude oil equivalent per year so hopefully this technology will change the linear path to a more uh, economical circular path of the rare earth. So if uh, we can collect the waste magnets and we can use our process to produce high purity rare earth elements and which can be remade into useful products again, at the life will be collected and processed. And this means savings of 95% of the rare earth elements collected and we can save almost 7 million barrels of oil, crude oil for processing per year. So this is the example of, let's say, hard disk drive magnets. We uh, dissolve them in, by electrochemical and other methods and pH adjusted. And then the solution will fit into the chromatography column and produce high purity rare earth elements. So for example, to separate the three rare earth elements in the waste magnets, uh, we only have two zones and, and, and a few four columns. Okay, so what you do is in zone one, you put in the feed mixture, loading and remove the impurities, connecting this with purification column, put in EDTA, and this exit is the mainly the ND band and the two side bands, DY, ND, and NDPR. And uh, then this mixed bands are further send into another column to separate in the pure DY and the, and the NDPR band was separated and the NPR in this uh, column. So uh, this is a very high purity, high yield process. Another example is to produce the, the uh, high purity rare earth from Basmacite from Mountain Pass, California. Right now, Mountain Pass has uh, about one and a half million tons of rare earth uh, reserve and uh, currently uh, they're sending 38,000 tons of the concentrate uh, to China for uh, purification. So basically the rock comes through extensive uh, processes to get a concentrate and then send to China for further purification. And we took a sample of this and using the Purdue technology to produce the following four high purity samples. These are the major components of this, uh, this uh, concentrate, lanthanum, cerium, uh, prosodinium, neodymium. So the advantages of Purdue technologies are the following. First, it's safer because we're only using aqueous solutions and dilute acid and base compared to solvent extraction with flammable solvents, solvents uh, toxic extractants, and harsh chemicals. And the chemical cost is lower, chemical cost is lower, 
and uh, we have high, higher purity and yield of products, and the productivity is at least 10 times higher. As a result, the footprint of the process is ten, ten, one tenth of the solvent extraction. The startup shutdown is also very quick, it's in terms of days rather than weeks. And uh, the feedstocks and products, uh, we can do the separations of many different feedstocks and different products, and it's much more flexible uh, approach. And the separators uh, in the separating of four rare earth elements, we only need five columns, whereas the, in the conventional, they will require almost 2,000 uh, mixer separate units. And the in initial investment, there should be one fifth of the solvent extraction. And we only produce a little bit sodium chloride as, our, our by, as a waste. And this can be recycled back to acid and base using uh, the conventional uh, chloroalkaline process. So it's much cleaner. So in conclusion, I would say the Purdue technologies are based on fundamental theories and simulation tools. And for this reason, they can be easily adaptable to different feedstocks, uh, different products, and different production scales. And we're shown here, the results shown that we're able to produce rare earth from waste magnets and ores at lab scale. So after this thing being scaled up, I think this can be a safer, cleaner, more efficient, more economical process than solvent extraction. And the American Resources is building the first commercial scale chromatography plant in Fisher, Indiana. If you have any questions, you can talk to Dan or uh, Mark Jensen uh, from this company. And we hope that this uh, is a potential for a sustainable and circular uh, rare earth economy uh, as sh shown before. So I hope in the next shed, I'll have uh, uh, the opportunity to tell you that rare earth elements are no longer rare in the United States. So of course, these work all done by graduate students and uh, supported by in part by the School of Chemical Engineering and uh, Department of Defense and uh, Purdue Safety Center and Mr. and Mrs. Bill Smith uh, Gift Fund and the Critical Research Institute of Japan supporting the Plastic Waste uh, Project. And uh, special thanks to Dan Hassler, which uh, recruited American Resources Corporations and Medallion Resources in supporting this process in, in the commercial uh, scale pilot testing and scale up. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions and Dan will help to answer any questions as well. Well, thank you so much, Linda. That is an amazing uh, lecture. We learned a lot. Uh, now we only got about five minutes here, but uh, maybe we can handle a couple of the questions uh, between you and Dan, please. Please. So I see one question here. What is the largest separator that's ever been made? The, you mean in terms of chromatography? So yeah, the largest was for the, you know, UO, uh, UOP largest uh, is 10 meters in diameter. Uh, yeah, 10 meters in diameters and more than 10 meters in height uh, in chromatography separation of uh, paraxylene from metaxylene, orthoxylene. Uh, those are the largest uh, chromatography columns mating for other separations. Oh, thanks. Another question. Can yeah. chromatology be used for lithium extraction? Yes, definitely. That's what we are looking at right now. So the lithium ion batteries, uh, we are in the process producing data to prove uh, this uh, lithium can be separated with nickel, cobalt, manganese uh, used in the lithium ion batteries, which is uh, you know, used in electric vehicles. Uh, so to, to provide energy. So yes, we, this is an ongoing project sponsored by the American Resources and the preliminary results are quite promising because the same chromatography principles, equations, simulation tools can be used for that important separation as well. Thanks. Uh, have uh, plated rare earth magnets been uh, uh, yes. changed into rare earth? Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. So this, uh, depending on the digestion methods, uh, in some uh, clean digestion methods, like in hydrothermal processing, the, the, the coating will fall off and uh, the magnets will be pulverized into a very fine powder and very easily dissolved in the weak acid and then for the chromatography separation. 
yes, we are we are looking we are working on that the method as well in comparison with electrolytic uh, process. Great. I'm going to ask the last question uh, for this uh, yes. uh, virtual fire set to Dan Hassler. Uh, and any other comments that you may have. The question is, when will mass commercialization occur for both extractor methods? Dan. I, you know, I would expect, you know, we've got to prove this thing out at a, at a commercial lab scale. That will be the de-risking event that causes us to be able to bring the big dollars in to build the commercial plants. Um, you know, you'd like to think five to six years from now, if not sooner, we could be at a commercial scale and begin to alleviate this monopoly that we're suffering uh, at from China. You know, I want to also point out that, you know, in my 40 year career, I have never had more fun than representing Purdue technologies to the marketplace. And the reason that I mention that is I know there are people on this call that could have just as much fun doing this. The scarce ingredient to success to the question that was asked earlier, the scarce ingredient for Purdue to get to the next level, honestly, are business people. People who can learn about technology like Linda's and translate it into a storyline that represents and describes its value and potential value and potential economics to non-technical people. That's basically what I do for this technology. And, and you know, you kiss, you kiss a lot of frogs in the meantime, but that's, there's tons of opportunities for alums to do this at Purdue. Well, we welcome your interest. Please email me, for example, I'll make sure uh, your inquiries forwarded to the uh, proper faculty or PRF colleagues. And then best in 40 years, congratulations to you and Linda. And then you must have started working for Purdue at age one. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to give the mic uh, for the last minute back to our wonderful host, uh, Chuck Davison. Chuck, thank you again. Uh, Chuck, you are still muted. Still muted. <laughs> uh, Chuck, Allowed me to, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 I, I, was, I was locked out. I, I muted myself and uh, the host decided that was a good idea. So you know, I stayed unmuted, I stayed muted. But uh, again, uh, for our guests, uh, Dean Chang, uh, it's been a real pleasure to be a part of this fireside chat. Uh, once again, we're learning about uh, so many exciting things uh, that are being developed at uh, Purdue Engineering and the great accomplishments of the staff and our partners have on this program. Uh, and also, Dean Chang, thanks again for your leadership. Uh, uh, we're just really excited on the path that uh, the college is headed. Thank you again, Chuck. And thank, thank you, you all for joining us here. Thank you, Linda, Dan, and thank see you, you. next month uh, coming up uh, right around the corner of virtual fireside. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>